So we're going to today carry on our series looking at the 12 disciples and, and what their lives can, can say for us. And today we're looking at Matthew. And the title for today is Drawing in the Outcast. And as we look at Matthew, we're going to see how Jesus called him to be a disciple. And we're going to see also how Matthew responded to that call. How did he respond? And as we look at this together, one of the most important things I want us to see is Jesus' concern for those who are on the edges of society and for us to make his concern part of our concern and our vision for reaching others. Now, it wouldn't be an understatement to say that Matthew would have been regarded as being the most notorious sinner in Jesus' band. His occupation was collecting taxes for the hated Roman overlords. As a tax collector, he worked for Rome in impressing and exploiting his own people. And in Jesus' day, employees of what would have been the Roman IRS were viewed as traitors, cheaters and thieves. They really were the lowest of the low. Because the Roman tax system allowed for excessive and unjust taxation, tax collectors were notorious for their greed. Now, because Matthew had his tax office in Capernaum, he technically worked for the Roman puppet king of the area, which was Herod Antipas, rather than directly for Rome. But that would have made precious little difference to how he would have been regarded. But when we read of Matthew's calling, it's all too easy just to accept that he obediently followed Jesus. But have we ever really stopped to think about what was happening here? Have we ever considered what this account tells us about the level of commitment that Matthew was making towards Jesus? And indeed, who he even thought he was? What was it that was so compelling about Jesus that he was prepared to leave his old life behind and simply follow him? As I said earlier, as a tax collector, Matthew would have been appointed by Herod Antipas, who was the puppet king for the region of Galilee. As a tax collector in those days, they gained their position through a bidding process, whereby they had to estimate how much money they could raise. And then their own income was then determined by how much they actually got from the tax paying people. Not a very fair sounding system. Now Simon, Andrew, James and John could very easily return to their trade of fishermen. And indeed they could easily provide for their own physical needs through fishing. But that wouldn't be the case for Matthew, who in all likelihood, having left his booth, would have been unable to return and so he had lost his sole source of income. Now, when we read the story, in reality, it's highly unlikely that Jesus simply walked up out of the blue to Matthew and called him to follow. Most likely, Matthew had heard Jesus teach. Maybe he'd seen him heal the sick, possibly talk to some of Jesus's followers in Capernaum. We don't know, but there's every chance with the level of interest that was there that he would have been aware of Jesus. But whatever the case may be, he was ready and willing to follow him. As so I think it's safe to assume he was already convinced who Jesus was. He didn't ask for time to think about it. He didn't ask Jesus to give him any more information. No, he was fully prepared to leave his old life behind, follow Jesus 
knowing there was no going back. And so we can see what it meant for Jesus, I'm oh, sorry, for Matthew to be called by Jesus. But have we again, have we ever given any real thought about what the people of Jesus' day would have made of all this? And also the level of criticism that Jesus may have faced because of his choice. Including a tax collector might have brought Jesus' criticism from two directions. The religious people would certainly see this as a sign that Jesus was not a godly man. And even the general public would find it difficult to accept the inclusion of this hated tax collector. And then if that wasn't bad enough, Jesus compounds the situation, not only by asking Matthew to follow him, but then willingly goes for a meal at his home. And he's not the only guest, as we're told, that many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. The Pharisees and presumably others could see all that was going on. And it would be an understatement to say they were not very impressed. But why? Why were they so aghast at what was going on? I think it's important to understand the level of disapproval that Jesus' association with such people would have caused. To fully appreciate how tax collectors and sinners were viewed in Jewish culture. Tax collectors were hated as instruments through which the Roman authorities were controlling the Jewish people. They were seen as traitors, apostates, made unclean through their willing association with pagans. Sinners were those who were publicly known not to follow the religious practices of the day. They were regarded as being irreligious and shameful, with tax collectors viewed as falling precisely into that category. So Jesus being seen to eat with such people would have been taken as a sign that he was friends with them. How could that be possible? How could you be a friend to someone like that? No, not unusually, the Pharisees didn't voice their displeasure directly at Jesus, but instead asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? It's actually interesting to note here what it is that they're unhappy about. It's not the fact that Jesus is with tax collectors and sinners, but it is because he's eating with them. So what does that tell us? Well, this suggests that their main concern and objection was in respect to purity. They may well have seen or simply assumed that Jesus would be offered food from unclean animals, or food which had not been properly tithed. Or maybe that he would be defiled by contact with unclean dishes or by contact with the clothing of people who were regarded as ritually unclean. All this would have been a direct challenge to the strict religious observances they taught. And that they encouraged their fellow Jews to conform to. And at the same time, Jesus sharing the table with those who were sinners would have been seen as very dubious behaviour on the part of a righteous person. Now Jesus hears their complaint and so he himself responds to their questions with a number of challenging statements. To begin with he says, it's not the healthy who need a doctor but the sick. Now this is an almost verbatim quote from a proverb attributed to the Greek philosopher Plutarch, who wrote, is not the custom of doctors to spend their time with the healthy, but where people are ill? Jesus is defended his actions by saying that just as a doctor looks after those who are unwell, 
That's why he is with the tax collectors and sinners, because they need to be healed by him. And then Jesus uses a quote from Hosea 6, verse 6. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And he admonishes them, he challenges these experts in the scriptures to learn what that verse really means. God doesn't want the outward motions of worship. He's not interested in purely sacrifice. God examines the heart for the evidence of the Spirit's transformation. He wants to see us display mercy. And then Jesus follows it with the statement, I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. That shouldn't be taken as meaning that Jesus is excluding the righteous from his mission, but that his priority was for sinners. But in reality, those who saw themselves as righteous, such as the Pharisees, were in truth self-righteous. They were as much need of Jesus as those who they regarded as sinners. In this case, the despised and rejected tax collector. Jesus came to call everyone to salvation and discipleship. But he will focus his efforts on the people who are open to his call and not on those who believe they have no need of him. So if I was to try and sum up what this passage means and its purpose, I would say this. It highlights that Jesus' ministry was one that was conducted in full public view. He wasn't afraid to court controversy to challenge the religious authorities who were only too willing to criticise his actions. It makes it very clear that Jesus will call who he chooses, regardless of their background or circumstances. All that is required on the part of those called is an act of simple obedience. No one, no one is excluded. And Jesus is ready and willing to be a friend to all. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 3, 23 to 24, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. The calling of Matthew is a clear example of the truth of that statement. So what are some of the applications for us reading this passage today? What are some of the lessons we can learn from Matthew's experience and what Jesus had to say? Well, firstly, it demonstrates that it is by grace we are saved and not by any good that we may believe is within us. It also shows us that we don't need to do anything to be made worthy, but that God meets us where we are. It's God who actively seeks us out. And if we accept his command to follow him, then we are justified. And from then on, we have a relationship with him. Secondly, it shows that no one is excluded from the saving work of Jesus. The first century tax collector would have been viewed as being irredeemable. And yet what Jesus did revealed this not to be the case. The Pharisees were frequently seen to be judgmental, quick to condemn. And it's a challenge for the Christian today not to be the same. There may well be many people we encounter who seem beyond redemption, but that's not for us to decide. Jesus came for all sinners, and so as his disciples, we have the responsibility to take the gospel message to all. And thirdly, this passage shows that just like Jesus, we shouldn't avoid having contact with sinners 
if I can use that word, for fear of being contaminated by them. Frequently the most powerful witness is not what we say, but what we do. And so by befriending them, just like Jesus did, the grace of God living within us has the opportunity to touch their lives. We were discussing this passage at college some time back, um, and indeed I wrote a, an exegesis on it. Um, and one of my lecturers get, at the college gives a very good example of what this could look like. And I, I'll be honest, to start with, it made us open our eyes a bit and think, really? He suggested inviting an imam to come into our church and speak about their faith. Now, at first, we might find that hard to, hard to get our head around. Surely we can't do that. But the reality is, why not? What would stop us? Is it fear of being exposed to another faith? If it is, then that is a baseless fear. When we remember that Jesus tells us very clearly at the end of Matthew's gospel, all authority on earth and in heaven is his. What it would do is bring the Iman into a place where they could be exposed to the grace and mercy of God. It's not on my to-do list yet, but it's a very interesting one to, to think on, isn't it? And then finally we see that whilst the grace of God is offered freely, it does not mean there will be no cost to ourselves. And that's why what Kathy shared with us is so, so pertinent for today. Matthew gave up his job as a tax collector and with it his income in order to follow Jesus. And we also may be required to do something similar. To follow Jesus might necessitate leaving behind a career, relationship, our previous goals in life. And just like Matthew, we have to be prepared to do this with no thought of ever taking them up again. That's exactly what I had to do when Jesus called me to train for Baptist ministry and left behind a 32 year career in policing and the financial security that came with it in order to follow the call, knowing full well there would be no going back. That was what Jesus asked of me. And even though it took me a while to do what he asked, well, okay, a year, I did do it. And despite all the challenges saying yes has brought, I have never once regretted the cost. And my relationship with Jesus has grown stronger and deeper as a result. If I may, I would like to ask you all a question. What might Jesus be asking you to leave behind in order to follow him more fully? You don't have to answer now, but maybe it's something to think on in the days ahead. A few final observations on Jesus' choice of Matthew. Whilst not all biblical scholars agree, it's been generally accepted that the writer of the Gospel of Matthew was indeed the disciple Matthew, the tax collector. His gospel was written to grab the attention of the Jewish reader. That was his passion. It was to reach his own people, the Jews, the very people who had regarded him with such hatred as a tax collector. He wanted them to know what he knew. And Matthew quotes the Old Testament scriptures more than the other three gospel writers combined. The opening paragraph of his gospel connects Jesus with the two great names in Israel's past, Abraham and David. And Matthew presents Jesus as Israel's true king, the Messiah, the son of the living God. Writing one of the Gospels is some legacy to leave behind. And so I think it's fair to say that Jesus made the right choice when he called Matthew. And that we can trust him 
to make the right choices with whoever he decides to call. If Jesus can call, change, and use a hated and despised tax collector of all people, it gives the rest of us hope as well. None are excluded. However we may see ourselves, however others may see us, Jesus sees us differently and can do in our lives what he did for Matthew and use us, if we are willing, for the benefit of his kingdom here on earth. Let's pray.